Welcome, everyone. This is a regular meeting of the Third Mutual, Third Laguna Hills Mutual Board of Directors, a California nonprofit mutual benefit corporation. Today is Tuesday, June 15th, 2021, 9.30 a.m. Uh, where our board is here in the boardroom and uh, things are opening up, so it's a great day. So at this time, I'll call the meeting to order, ask everyone to turn off their uh, electro electronic devices and uh, we have a quorum, we see, and uh, we'll go into the Pledge of Allegiance led by Director uh, Karimi. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. At this time, uh, I'll acknowledge the media at a distance. I don't see anyone here. Uh, do I hear a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, did you get that grant? Okay. So uh, unless there's any objections, we'll approve the agenda. Okay, hearing no objections, it's approved. Approval of the meeting minutes of May 14, May 18, and May 21. Do I hear a motion to accept those? I make the motion to approve. Okay, was that Reza? Yes. Okay, is there a second? I second. Okay. Any objection, corrections, additions? Okay, hearing none, they stand approved. Uh, report of the chair. Like I said, it's a great day, folks. Things are opening up. Sunshine is out. I hope everyone has a great day, but still play safe. So uh, it's a great time. I want to announce that uh, Ernesto Munoz, who's been in charge of our MNC department, will be leaving us soon. We thank him so much for being with us from almost the time we became uh, <coughs> self-governed to now he helped stabilize the MNC department and uh, back then the general service department as well. So we thank him for his time, and I'll hold off on other details of his departure and what his future plans are, and our CEO will be covering those. I uh, want to thank everybody for their participation in the car rally we had a couple weeks ago for our initiative on voting yes. We have so many people that have come forward as volunteers to help us, uh, to call people, to give out tracts and brochures, and answer questions to people, just a hearty thank you to everyone and to the board members too for stepping up and helping us out in that endeavor. So uh, we wanna encourage everybody to take your ballot. If you laid it aside, pick it up, and go through the instructions and please mail it. Remember, we are shooting for over 67% of all owners and members in Third Mutual to uh, bring about uh, a great, uh, I should say, <laughs> to help us correct our CCNRs. So it makes it easier for us to help control our insurance. So once again, thanks to everybody for that. And uh, one other thing I would like to ask people if they would in the future, Third Mutual, uh, the business of Third Mutual, most of it is done in the committees. So I would ask you, uh, please don't come to the board meeting. Please go to one of the committee meetings, the appropriate one, to have uh, your comments addressed or your situations addressed. That way uh, we have a chance to bring it forward to the board. Everybody understands what's happening out of committees. So if you need help with that, we can help direct you to the proper, to, proper committee, but please do that if you would in the future. Okay, that uh, concludes my comments and I'd like to go to the open forum, please. Do we have any people for the open forum? I do not see anybody on Zoom who wishes to give a comment. Although okay. I believe that we do have some written comments. We what? Hello, this is Eileen. Oh, okay. This is Eileen Fallen, and yes, we do have two that were sent in. Um, one of the members who sent in a comment is in the participant group, Rosemary Quinn. Would you, um, I know because she's outside, I don't know whether she would like to present this herself or not. But I think in the interest of time, since it'll take about a, a 
10 or 20 seconds to bring her in. I'll go ahead and read it on her behalf. Okay. Good morning. From walking the community to promote voting yes to the insurance amendment, I have found that third mutual owners really want to understand the plain insurance facts involved in our current ballot. It's a lot of numbers that need to be put in order, and some people are very confused. Think of it this way. Before 2019 brought fires and other environmental disasters, Laguna Woods Village was valued at $700 million. Our current CCNRs, or governing documents, have always required that the third board provide insurance to cover 100% replacement value of the units, or $700 million at that time. This coverage cost approximately $1 million. Since 1997, we've never filed more than $10 million worth of claims in any one year. This was affordable. But in 2020, the insurance carriers required an updated property assessment, resulting in Laguna Woods Village's value being raised to $1.6 billion, over two times the prior value. As a result, our 2020 bill unexpectedly shot up to $4.1 million. And to get that level of coverage, it took 25 insurance companies, each assuming a part of the liability. Yet remember, that total purchase was not even half the new amount that was required. So the result in 2021 is increased fees, was increased fees. Condo owners got a $20 a month condo fee increase, plus we had to take the remaining of over $3 million owed out of an emergency fund. California condo law requires that this money must be repaid within two years. This same law also caps any raise of condo fees in one year to 20%. That means that we could be raised up to $93 per manor per month in 2022. But the owners are the ones who have the power to make the difference in how much our 2022 monthly dues could be increased. They can vote yes to amend the CCNRs to not require obtaining the unattainable 100% replacement cost. For prudence, there's a requirement in the amendment that the board must buy at least two times Laguna Wood Village's probable maximum loss which according to an independent study is $280 million of insurance. But the board will buy as much coverage as is affordable and if they are not forced to buy more. Unless two thirds of the 6,103 condo owners or 4,071 persons return their ballot to make this current vote on insurance a legal election, plus then at least 50% plus one of the owners must vote yes to amend our CCNRs. These current governing documents will still require third board to buy the full $1.6 billion of insurance coverage and the maximum increase would have to be given. So it's up to us, only by returning the ballot currently in your home by June 28th and voting yes to Three amend minutes have CCNRs, expired. Do, we have, do we have any chance of stemming an explosion of our monthly fee? Sincerely, Rosemary Quinn, 54, a O B. And we have one more comment and it's from Paul Hutchins at 3036 Via Vista. We received a letter from VMS a few days ago that informed us our water will be turned off on June 14th from 8 to 3 p.m. And the water shutoff valves will be replaced to accommodate the water supply line epoxy coating program. Our building has two shutoff valves one for the three manors on each side of our Del Mar building. And we weren't aware that our copper pipes are to be recoded. So we called the projects division of the maintenance and construction department. A rep explained the letter should probably be reworded accurately to explain shutoff valves and each manor will be installed. So each manor has its own shutoff valve and not the shutoff valves for each building and the entire building would not have to be shut down should only one man or need water or pipe repair or maintenance. The rep then explained our building is not on the list for pipe relining, but they want to change the valves just in case there are future problems. This seems like a waste of time and money. It doesn't take all that long to change these valves. And if a building is not having problems, why change valves now? Why do it on the need to change basis? If a building's pipes are causing problems, change the valves and line the pipes. To presuppose all shutoff valves and all manners need to be changed now to avoid future problems just seems like a waste of time and money when doing so isn't necessary in all buildings. At any rate, the letter is not exactly accurate in what it says. Accurate and informed communication is an ongoing problem in our community. Thank you for considering my missive. 
Okay. And that's all I have. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Okay, um, any responses here to Rosemary Quinn? Anyone would like to make? Okay, Robert. Yeah, first of all, I'd like to thank Rosemary Quinn, not only for her uh, words that were just spoken by Aline Paulin on her behalf, but also for all the efforts she's made out in the community to uh, try to get out the vote and get people to vote yes. There are a couple of things I'd like to just clarify. I think that uh, there are some slight errors in what uh, Ms. Quinn was stating. First of all, yes, she's correct. $700 million was the evaluation for the whole village up until last year. Last year, when the village was reevaluated, the total valuation for the village, that's United, Third, the Towers, GRF, et cetera, was $3.4 billion. Third Mutual is $1.6 billion of that $3.4 billion. And so that's one thing I want to just make sure that people understand, that when we go to market now, we have to tell the insurance companies that we are worth $1.6 billion when previously we were only worth $700 million. The second point I'd like to make is that we need 67% of the membership to vote yes for the amendment to pass. It is not 67% voting, it's 67% voting yes. So obviously there are gonna be some people who vote no. So we, obviously, we clearly need more than 67% of the membership to actually vote. So hopefully we can get that 67% yes vote. If we don't get the 67% yes vote, then the amendment fails. The 51% that Ms. Quinn is referring to, the 50% plus one, is if we get that in all the submutuals, we then first would have to possibly go to court. That could take six to nine months to be able to get through the court system to get approval if we get the 50% plus one uh, representation voting yes. And even then, there's no guarantee that the courts will support that kind of activity. So please, it's very, very important that we get a 67% yes vote from the 6,102 members. Thank you very much. Any other comments to Rosemary? Okay. I just wanted, uh, Go ahead. Excuse me, brother. I just wanted to uh, join with Director Munchneck in thanking Ms. Quinn for her support in this initiative. It's really important that all the residents are involved in this initiative because we all benefit. So again, thank you, Ms. Quinn, for your, your support for this initiative. Okay. On to Paul and the water shutoff situation. Uh, Jeff or Siobhan, would you like to answer that? Yes. Um, we, we will take, we're evaluating the process and making sure that we're looking at all of our system for repairs, not just one off. Uh, we obviously deal with emergencies, but we're looking at being proactive and that's the reason for evaluating the whole system as opposed to just one at a time. Okay, yeah, I know in my building, uh, they did the same thing. Uh, only my building needs it. <laughs> and. Uh, We've had, when you turn on the spigot, all of a sudden it'll start leaking or shooting water. So happy to have that done. But uh, like uh, our CEO said, it's better to be proactive than end up in a situation where it's an emergency. So uh, thank you, Paul, and hope you understand the situation. Any other comments to Paul? Okay. Uh, I understand there's no more, so we can go on to item nine, the CEO COO report, please. Thank you, President Parsons. Um, good morning to everybody and welcome back to the community center. Uh, I have two items. Uh, one, uh, just to follow up on what uh, President Parsons said with regards to Ernesto, um, uh, who has uh, tendered his resignation uh, to the organization. We're gonna miss Ernesto greatly. Um, Ernesto has been with us um, for almost five years, um, handling both general services and MNC operations. He has um, provided great leadership and um, to both of those uh, departments, and especially in MNC has brought a coordinated effort with regards to the largest um, manpower uh, division and department that we have with um, um, diligence um, and providing uh, new and updated information 
and just coordinating the, the amount of activity that we have with regards to uh, running from electrical and plumbing all the way to our painting operation, all the way to all our pro um, projects that we have in the capital side that we provide for not only the mutuals, but for GRF as well. So um, um, for personal reasons, um, Ernesto is, is leaving us. Um, we're gonna miss him a great deal. Um, and I wanna just personally thank him and I know our, um, our department heads and, and all of the boards have been thanking him as he's, once he's announced that and appreciate that. So um, we are in the midst of, um, of the process of um, the replacement and that started as soon as we received the resignation. Um, in the interim, um, Guy West will be the interim director um, until we make a decision on the specifics of the new person coming on board or uh, multiple pr positions potentially, because we're looking at whether or not we're gonna stay with current structure or change that structure up. And as we um, start to evaluate uh, candidates, and that'll give us a better idea of how we're gonna move forward. And so you'll hear a lot about in the near future, especially by the time we get to your next board meeting for sure. Uh, the second item, ha I have a little PowerPoint presentation that I want to provide with regards to um, today. Um, as you know, today is the day in which the governor um, took away the tiered system and uh, reopening plan for the state of California. So I just wanted to go over a quick PowerPoint presentation with regards to what we have um, implemented as um, starting today and what we are looking forward to in the next month or so. So um, next slide. Uh, the first thing is with regards to opening today at the community center here, um, we're gonna have hours of 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Monday through Friday. The community fin fitness center here at the facility is going to be open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Friday. The Mac Learning Center and the PC workshops will follow the same uh, guidelines as far as the time frames on uh, Monday through Friday, but they are coordinated by their volunteer groups up there. It's a very small, a couple of rooms up there and, and really their, their volunteers coordinate their, their activities up there. Our, uh, uh, probably our biggest activity as far as foot traffic coming in is our table tennis um, um, operations uh, will be from 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Monday through Friday um, right now. And then we will obviously at some point in time look at expanding it. Part of the, uh, as I described as part of the expansion uh, that we see in the future is is about our, our ability to manage the facilities, and we'll talk about that at the very end. Resident services and manner alterations. During the COVID process, when we reopened, we established a schedule by appointments process, and that was a half day for each of those. We've now expanded that, so both operations will be uh, handling appointments from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. daily. So we wanna make sure that um, residents that already have been using this system continue to use the process of making appointments if they need to come in and have a physical meeting with staff. A lot of our information and a lot of the activity for both residents and services and manner alterations are being handled now on telephone and over e by email, which um, really was facilitated uh, by the COVID scenario and our staff having to uh, deal with our residents via phone and um, email. So the scheduling allows people to come in though if they need specific um, uh, things that we need to address from that perspective. Um, from the real estate side, um, open houses and estate sales can now resume. Um, that was a big one that our, um, our real estate um, side of the equation was looking forward to. Next slide. Uh, with regards to our clubhouses, go walk through them real quickly. Clubhouse one, um, eight to eight uh, daily will be open. Uh, this is all of our activities there with regards to billiards, drop-in lounge, indoor archery, uh, the gym, no restrictions, no reservations are necessary any longer. And that'll be 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. and Monday through Friday, and 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. on Saturday and Sunday. Also, our indoor mini gym will be open for badminton, pickleball, volleyball. Again, no reservations are necessary. With regards to Clubhouse 2, uh, right now it's a minimum use at this point in time, but we are doing indoor recreation classes and our indoor um, bingo program um, is being used there at Clubhouse 2. Next slide. Um, Clubhouse 4. Um, this is a, a active clubhouse, but no restrictions or reservations any longer are necessary. Um, and the contact the clubhouse uh, for specific studio times. 
So if you can, if you need to um, go to wood shop or the ceramics and you want to find out the specific studio times that that's going to be open, you can call 597-4291. Uh, and, and that was the phone number that you can call specifically will get you to the studio times that they're going to be available. Clubhouse 5 um, will be from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday with regards to the game room. The gym at Clubhouse 5 will be 5.30 a.m. to 9 p.m. daily. And then indoor uh, recreation classes will be held um, during this time period and, and depending on scheduling. And then we'll continue and start um, having our Monday movies, which we just started back up. And, and our bocce ball um, will be no restrictions and reservation with regards to bocce ball. Lawn bowling, uh, next slide please. Um, lawn bowling will have no restrictions or reservations um, that they previously had. Paddle tennis will have uh, no restrictions and reservations with regards to uh, hours on uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, noon to dusk, Tuesday and Thursday, 7 a.m. to noon, and first, third, uh, Saturday, 7 a.m. to noon. Pickleball, which is very active in the community as you know, um, no reservations required from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. Monday through Friday, but we are still re um, using the court's reservation systems from 3 o'clock to 8 p.m. Monday through Friday and all day Saturday and Sunday. And this is to ensure that as we transition back, the people are, um, that go all the time, they know that there's no reservations required in our prime time, what we call 7 a.m. to 3, but we want to make sure that there's a reservation process so people that don't go during that prime time can get a court and be able to do um, their activities out there with regards to pickleball. So that's where we're gonna continue the reservation system in the evenings or afternoons and then on Saturday and Sunday. Next slide. Tennis, um, open daily. Um, no, Again, no reservations um, or restrictions with regards to mask or anything like that. And with regards to this, we've divvied it up also. Uh, no reservations required on courts one through six. And then with regards to our reservation system, we are using that on 7, 8, 9, and 10, 7 a.m. to noon um, on courts 7 and 8, and then all day on courts 9 and 10. Again, this is a, allowing us to control and make sure that people are getting usage of these facilities and not um, over impacting by just everybody showing up at one time. With regards to our pools, which is probably one of our most active areas, all of our pools are gonna be open um, except for pool one. I'll talk about that in just a second. Pool two, however, is going to be our only reservation pool. And that is our um, lap swimming pool. So because we wanna control people in the laps, um, we're gonna continue with the reservation system there um, from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. And we have five lanes there. In pool four, five, and six, that will be open swim. So people can just show up. There are some lanes there um, and there's some active usage of those lanes, but we aren't setting up a reservation system with regards to the activities at the other pool. I mentioned pool one, um, a very active pool, and unfortunately the boiler broke at pool one, and it's taken us a long, long time to get that boiler here from back east. I unfortunately ran into a situation where in order for the boiler to actually leave their facility, it had to be federally inspected and the federal inspections were shut down. And so now they're backlogged. So that's caused us to have a backlog. Um, we had an eight to, eight to 12 week time frame. We're already past eight weeks. So we're hopefully in the next three or four weeks, we're gonna have that boiler here and back up into operations because that's a very, very active pull. Next slide. Um, one of the um, things that came up with a lot of dialogue was how are we going to address guests coming back into the community and activities. With regards to the pools right now, we're controlling a guest uh, um, at an age bracket of 15 and older to be at the pools, but you can invite guests. And then with regards to golf, um, when we went into the COVID scenario and got our reservation system set up, we were fully engaged with golf just by our residents. All the tee times were taken up by our residents. We anticipate that that's going to lessen as other activities are out there for people to participate in. So we're gonna take a look at our guests coming in in non-prime time hours for sure, which would be later in the afternoon, um, and, and we'll address it. 
as they are available. So if you do have a guest and you are looking at wanting to play in the non prime time areas with a guest, we want you to contact the clubhouse first. And that's at 597-4336. And they can let you know whether or not there is available or what hours um, are available for non prime time hours for guests, um, if you're going to bring that. And then the last two are uh, critical areas that we've had in the community and are back open and we're glad to, um, that they're back open. That's the History Center from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Monday through Friday. And then the library with all our great volunteers out there. No restrictions at the library. The hours are 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. on Wednesday, and 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. on Saturday. Last slide. So um, moving forward. Um, clubhouses one, two, and five, we, we are hoping to ex expand our hours um, come July. And Clubhouse seven, we're um, looking at the bridge room reopening with the bridge club and their activities there. And then the clubhouse reservations with regards to moving forward with all the clubs and then private parties, we'll start gearing up that reservation system. Um, we're pulling all that together. We've been um, sending out surveys to all the clubs, making sure that we know um, how they're going to be active and how their participation is going to occur once they come, once we're fully operational. So we'll start that and gear that up um, in July. And then our equestrian center is going to open up in July. And the only reason why it has an open center is that we're right now in the midst of the arena project being redone. So the arena is being um, uh, up upgraded and it's going to be a better facility so that we can have more equestrian activities and we'll be gearing that up for July 6. I want to go back up to the top there and mention the expanded hours. Um, we have been in the midst of the last couple of months when we kind of knew that there was going to be a reopening at some point in time. Uh, we started our, our recruitment for um, as many as 50 to 60 part-time recreation people that we uh, let go due to the COVID scenario. And we run into the scenario that many businesses out there and, and other competitors, I'll call it, uh, have found is that the part-time um, employment um, equation is very, very difficult right now. Um, we're, we're going to look at part-time employees from the village here, um, but all of them are, are, are real tight right now. So as we are able to expand our staffing we'll be able to expand the hours and operations at the clubhouse. And we're anticipating doing that next big expansion coming in July 6th. And that's all I have. And I'll turn it over to Siobhan. I know she has a few other items. Thank you, Jeff. Honorable President, members of the board, I have a few announcements for you this morning. I wanna start with one from Orange County Vector Control District, Mosquito District, oh, I'm sorry. Mosquito season is upon us as you're well aware. They remind us that the invasive 80s mosquito now resides in every Orange County city. And they're calling on residents to help increase awareness and take measures to reduce the mosquito population. Their slogan is to tip, toss, and take action. Tip out standing water weekly, toss unneeded containers, take action and apply repellent to expose skin while outdoors. The Disaster Preparedness Task Force aims to inform and prepare residents for major disasters. The American Red Cross will present an earthquake and flood preparedness webinar on Thursday, August 10th at 10 a.m. Please RSVP to disasterprep at vmsinc.org to reserve your space and receive the Zoom link. And again, that date is August 10th at 10 a.m. The July 4th golf cart parade is upon us. Residents are invited to celebrate this July 4th as part of the community Independence Day Golf Cart Parade. The parade will start from Clubhouse One at 9 a.m. and registration is available via ActiveNet and is free. And a reminder to our new residents, residents new to the village are encouraged to attend a virtual new resident orientation session. These informational sessions allow an opportunity for residents to learn more about their mutual and meet a board member who represents the mutual. The next third orientation session for new residents is Friday, July 16th at 9 a.m. Residents must RSVP by emailing executive assistant Becky Jackson, and she can be reached at becky.jackson at vmsinc.org. And lastly, a reminder that the free bulky item pickup for this month 
is Saturday, July, June 19th. Excuse me, that's Saturday, June 19th. Please remember to notify resident services prior to setting out your bulky items. They can be reached at 949-597-4600. And you need to please place your bulky items near the trash enclosure or in the same location that you sent out your trash bins on a weekly basis. Please set out the items no later than 7 a.m. on collection morning, which again is Saturday, June 19th. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. A question for you, uh, the disaster preparedness store, do we know when that's gonna open so people can get uh, supplies and things like that? Right. Um, I can answer okay. that. Um, the office, which is located down at the end of the, um, at the, the, what do you call it? North End, yeah. Um, they're waiting for the community center to open before they actually open up the office. And once this opened up, then they will have uh, disaster preparedness supplies. Thank you. Okay. And it's come to my attention uh, three times recently that people have still not received a ballot. So I'll uh, give you the phone number if you haven't received a ballot on our insurance initiative. Please call this number to request one. The number is 855-240-0363. I'll say that once again. 855-240-0363. Okay? Uh, so that should answer the question of several people out there that are sending me messages on that. Hopefully that'll help. Um, you know, we talk a, a lot in our meetings about MNC and about landscape, but I think there's one division that's a little bit uh, overlooked simply because they're in the background, but without them, we couldn't function. And uh, every week during this pandemic, I've been thinking about this section, and that's Chuck Holland and his staffs. And I'd like to do a big shout out to them for everything that they've done. They've uh, been working, getting our systems up uh, from uh, what's happened in the past, as well as with COVID, a lot of people have had to work at home, which has taken special time from these folks. They've probably given up time also to uh, make connectivity possible and uh, make it so that if you call in, you can get an answer, get a uh, schedule for an appointment or whatever. But uh, I'd really like us to take a moment and just thank Chuck and his staff for all they've done. Chuck told me this morning that through this and none of his people got sick. He didn't get sick. Praise the Lord on that. <laughs> or we would have really been in a bad situation. So uh, I'd like to just give him a hand clap if you would. Thank you so much. Any questions anybody has for Jeff or Siobhan for their reports? Raise it. Can I? <clears throat> Uh, Jeff, on, uh, due to the COVID, I guess we closed all of the water fountains through the community. Some of them are still not operational. What are we planning to? Because next a few days, we're going to be in three, triple digit heat, and now we open, everyone's going to be outside. And uh, first, that one, and the second is do we have any other emergency uh, uh, plan in place for people being outside in triple digit? Uh, are we looking after them and how? So the first one is yes, we're, we're going around and re-engaging or um, re-engaging those yes. facilities that were off. Um, we do have, uh, we work with the city as well with regards to cooling centers if, if it reaches a certain temperature for a certain period of time, but we do have in place a cooling center operation. Oh, well, that's great. That's great. Uh, the other thing about the clubhouse reservation that pushed back to July 6, is that due to the, the staffing issue or why it was? Because a lot of people were told it was 15 and they keep calling and they saying that, oh, okay, well, why is that pushed back? Can you explain that so people understand better? Sure, the, um, again, the, the first priority was to get the um, clubhouses open so general activities could happen there. But with regards to um, fully operational, we're just short manpower. Um, and that is the process we're engaged right now in trying to recruit like crazy to, to get that staffing up. And as that staffing gets beyond the 80% up to 100% uh, 
um, then we'll be back in full operation. It, it also allows us to make sure that when the clubs get active back in the community centers, that we'll be able to staff their needs, which is setting up tables and setting up chairs, um, which is a responsibility that we have. So that's really what it comes down to is that we can expand as fast as we can get um, fully operational as far as staff. But we wanted to get things open as much as possible right now. Okay, uh, another thing that's come to my attention uh, from a couple people, they said that the lighting reset uh, process hasn't been completed because of daylight savings time changeover and at their particular units that uh, no one's come around to reset. So their lights coming on at odd times or going off at odd times. Uh, Siobhan, do you have any information on that or who they can call? They, they can always report it to resident services. We take the location and then send someone out to okay. review the situation. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. Kind of caught me unaware because I hadn't thought about it. Any other comments for uh, Jeff, Siobhan? Okay, moving on, we'll go on to item number 10. Consent calendar. Do I hear a motion to accept the consent calendar? I'll make the motion to accept it. Second. Okay, Robert seconds it. Uh, any objections? Hearing none, we'll consider that by consent. Okay, unfinished business. I'll turn it over to Lynn on this. Entertain a motion to approve the amendment to the hate policy. Yes, <clears throat> at the last board meeting, uh, I brought this um, amendment up, but I want to make a correction in our packet. It is called the hate policy, but in our packet, it says anti-hate policy for the resolution name, but it's actually, we, we changed that because we pulled this resolution from 2006 and updated it, and we wanted to call it the hate policy, not the anti-hate, so I just wanted to make that uh, clear. So anyway, I'd like to make a motion to um, approve this hate policy. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, any seconds it? Uh, I believe we're going to vote at this time. Is that right, Grant? So if you can bring it up on our screens. If you'd like to uh, vote via hand right now, we're still oh, okay. on the system. I, I want to uh, make a note that this is, uh, it, it has passed this 28-day notification for re member review. Thank okay, you. Uh, any discussion? <clears throat> okay, all in favor signify by raising your hand. Any opposed? I was a bit late to say yes. Oh, okay. Okay, so I think that's a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. We'll move on to item 12, which I don't think we have any new business. Does anybody have something? Okay, on to item 13, committee reports. And we'll start with the report of the Finance Committee. Director Muchene. Thank you very much, President Parsons. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to share with you. Is your microphone? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, President Parsons. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to share with you the revenue and expenses for the month of April 2021. In the charts that follow, you will see the dollar figures and percent for the most recent three months of 2021. That's February, March, and April. Grant, if you would uh, please provide the next slide. This slide depicts income for Third Mutual for the last three months, February, March, and April. Looking at the far left-hand side of the slide, assessment revenue year-to-date at the end of April is $11,533,000, which is $2,883,000 more than reported for the previous month of March. For the first four months of 2021, we have averaged $2,883,250 of assessment revenue each month. So as one can readily see, our income from assessment revenue continues to be right on target for the year. I ask that you now look at the non-assessment revenue, which is the set of bar graphs second from the left side of the slide. Non-assessment revenue is a positive $571,000 for the month of April. This is a turnaround from the previous month of $713,000. The $713,000 is derived by <coughs> taking the negative $142,000 from the month of March and adding it to the positive 
$571,000 for the month of April. I'm pleased to be able to tell you that the vast positive gain in the non-assessment revenue has to do with the shifting of investments from bond funds to short-term treasuries. More on this later in the presentation. Now, shifting your gaze to the bar graph in the middle of the slide, you will be looking at total revenue, which for the four months ending 30th of April was $12,104,000. Now, at this set of bars second from the right side of the slide, for the cumulative months of February, March, and April, third had $10,020,000 in total expenses. This represents an increase in the total expense of $2,826,000 for April over March. As expected, uh, our expenses are increasing as more things are opening up and as we get back to projects such as waistline remediation and fumigation, to name two of them. Now, looking at the bar graph on the far right of the chart, this is the visual for the net revenue. Third Mutual had net revenue of $2,084,000. $1,313,000 for the four months ending April 30th. This is up an additional $771,000 from the previous month of March. While this is good news, please know that it is temporary since, as I indicated above, this is the time of year that we're beginning many of our projects. So our expenses will go up and our positive net revenue will decrease. Next slide, Grant, please. This slide presents data for income for the operating fund only for the three months ending April 30th. Looking at the bar graph at the far left of this chart, assessment revenue over the most recent 30 days of April was $1,747,000, exactly the same for each of the previous months. Uh, we expect this monthly figure to be the same since it is money that GRF transfers to our account from the monthly assessments each member pays. Now, shifting your gaze to the second set of bar graphs from the left, non-assessment revenue increased by $140,000 for the three-month period at the end of April. We had a total non-assessment revenue of $493,000 year-to-date. Shifting your gaze to the middle of the slide, Third Mutual had a total revenue in the operating fund of $1,887,000 for the month of April, which is fairly similar to what we experienced for the month of March. Adding the first four months together, total revenue for the operating fund only for 2021 is $7,482,000. The bar graph, second from the right side of the chart, depicts total expenses during the same period for the operating fund of February, March, and April. This amount is $6,928,000, an increase in total expenses for the past month of $1,939,000, which again is very similar to the previous month. Subtracting total expenses year to date from total revenue year to date takes us to the bar graph on the far right which leaves us now with a positive variance of $554,000 for the four months ending April 30th. Grant, next slide if you would please. This slide compares our actual revenue expenses and expenses to what was originally budgeted. Looking at the non-assessment revenue, the second set of bar graphs from the left, the actual is in red, the budgeted is in green, while the variance is in kind of a yellow gold. The non-assessment revenue had a negative variance of $150,000 year to date. While still negative, this is a sizable improvement over the previous month, which had a negative variance of $682,000 of actual over budgeted for year to date at the end of March. Now, looking at the bar graphs in the section second from the right, total expenses, one can see that our actual year to date were $1,578,000, which is less than budgeted. The bar graph on the far right shows us that Third Mutual is left with $1,427,000 revenue over expenses for year to date ending 430, 2021. Next slide, Grant. This slide provides you with a picture of select budget items and the current variance associated with each for the month of April. 
You will also have the opportunity with this slide to see how each of these variances compares to the variance of each category at the end of both February and March. The top bar in each category, which are the green, represent the variances at the end of February, while the middle bars, which are gold, represent the dollar amount of the variance for each category at the end of March. And finally, the bottom bar in each category, the brown bars, represent this reporting period, April. As you can see, looking only at the brown bars, which are the bars most significant for third at this moment in time, third continues to have positive favorable variances for each of the categories of outside service, employee compensation, materials and supplies, and other operating for the period ending April 30th. There has been a positive variance in each of these categories for the past three months. The last three categories each continue to have an unfavorable variance. There has been an increase in the usage of water and electricity that has continued to cause the current negative variance and probably will continue to do so as we move forward into the next few months. The issue with insurance is one that we have talked about regularly for months. And as you know, the board is working very hard to address this moving forward. The cost of our property insurance premiums, as has been discussed already, went up dramatically last year, and we already had set the assessment before we knew what the premiums would be. Hence, we need to continue taking money from the disaster fund to underwrite the cost of insurance for this year. One way we are trying to address this pressing issue is with the ballot initiative that has basically been talked about ad infinitum that hopefully you're all aware of and are casting your ballot before the 28th of June so that the board has greater flexibility in procuring insurance. With regards to investments, with the very low, almost non-existent interest rates on our bond investments, there's been a loss of $71,000 year to date. Grant, next slide, please. This slide depicts two pie charts for comparison purposes, month over month, again, for total non-assessment revenue. Now, when we compare the two charts, the revenue month over month for each category has increased. Looking at the pie chart for the end of April, overall, we see an increase of $159,491. Comparing the two pie charts, March and April, we have seen a slight uptick in the categories of lease processing fees, indicating an increase in the number of renewals and also in new leases. Laundry revenue also saw a very slight increase month over month. The resale processing fee went down month over month because the number of resales for April decreased from the number in March. The good news about this, which you will see later in this presentation, is that the total resales year to date is up over the same time last year, as is the average resale value. Grant, if you would, the next slide, please. As reported earlier, third had additional expenses of $2,826,042, which is actually just slightly more than our expenses for March. So we've had total expenses of $10,020,244 year to date. For those who continue to ask about the cost of our legal fees, on a month over month, the fees have stabilized and represent about 2% of our total expenses. When viewing the category of legal fees, please keep in mind when we speak about thirds legal expenses, this is a category that not only includes our expenses for the services of the legal team to third board, but also our share of VMS's legal fees that third is obligated to pay. What this category does not include is monies that third receives as reimbursements from insurance companies and or legal settlement offsets. As I reported last month, I continue to work with the current director of finance uh, for third, and, I and I'm able to present, next month I hope to present a more accurate picture as it relates to actual legal expenses. The director of finance and I will continue to work on this issue until I can share with you a clear picture. Next slide, please. For this slide, I always like to direct you to look first at the lower right-hand corner. As of April 30th, Third had $30,214,000 in reserves uh, in the, and in the disaster fund. As I reported last month, at the end of March, we had $29,818,000. So we've seen an increase of, uh, of approximately $396,000 for the month. The replacement fund at the end of March 
was 18,540,000. Well, at the end of April, you'll see it says on the chart, 19,267,000 dollars, an increase of 727 over the previous month in this category. Also, it should be noted that year to date, had, third had 4 million. $622,000 in contributions and interest added to these funds, while we had $3,048,000 in expenditures. So at the moment, things are moving in the right direction with contributions and interest outpacing expenditures from these funds by $1,574,000 for the month. Please note that there is still some question that has been rightfully raised by Director Lynn Jarrett regarding the Garden Villa Fund. We have asked the Director of Finance for an explanation regarding this particular fund going back at least six months. We are awaiting this information and will report to you our findings at the next available meeting. Grant, slide number nine, please. This slide compares the different fund balances for the past five years, which have averaged approximately $29.4 million. As you can see from the slide, we have stemmed the tide in terms of losses and related to our investments. We are now looking, we are still holding our own overall when compared to fund balances last year. Slide number 10, please, Grant. This slide provides you with a picture of the resale situation for third for the past three years. As I told you last month, January with 41 resales represented the best January in the last three years, while February with 30 resales also represented the best February in the last three years. March at 44 resales, as with the previous months, represents the best March for the past three years. While the resales for April were not as robust as they were for March, hence the decrease in the percent the resales contributed to the non-assessment revenue as reported earlier, April still represents the best April for the past three years with 26 resales. A total of 141 resales to date is an increase of 34 over last year at this same time. The good news continues in terms of resales. Looking at the top right hand corner of the slide, we can see dollar wise how we compare average sales year to date. The average sales price per mana for the first four months of 2021 is $441,749. While a slight increase over the same period last year, it still represents an increase. Since these slides were developed, I have received updated information that includes resales for May. May sets the record for the last three Mays with, with 39 resales, with the average resale up almost $7,000 from the month of April. That concludes the Treasurer's report for this month. Our next Finance Committee meeting is scheduled for Tuesday, July 6th at 1.30. I will assume that since our monthly board meeting is now in person, our Finance Committee will also be in person if COVID restrictions remain lifted. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, did you have an update on our lease percentage right now? I think it's 27.1% is the that, last I heard. I don't, that I don't know, so, sorry. Okay. So uh, that sounds really good. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Okay. Yeah, raise it. On uh, the employee compensation, we are pretty much on the positive side a lot, but we are understaffed. So what's the expectation as we go forward through the year? Because that's going to change, so people don't, don't get used to it. That's yes, what I'm right. To say. That, you're exactly right, Reza. Uh, that employee compensation, as we bring on more staff, as we start to open up more of the facilities and need more staff to staff those facilities, we'll definitely see a decrease in that particular category. So you're right for pointing that out. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Moving along to report of Architectural Controls and Standards Committee. Director Ingdahl. Thank you, uh, President Parsons. Uh, the ACSC meeting last met on Just May 24th, this uh, past month. Drop the mic on. on. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Details. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, we met on uh, May 24 this past month. Uh, Mr. Donacost mentioned hiring a new head of the resale inspections, Mr. Abram Balestros, I believe it is. Uh, he's a returning former member of MCA, VMS, so uh, he'll, he'll be on board pretty quickly. 
Uh, Mr. Donacost also mentioned a couple of possible future ideas to help reduce costs and improve service. Uh, one was the use of technology to uh, reduce inspection problems. And he's also considering promoting from within where possible to make use of existing experience and system familiarity, as well as provide employee opportunity and incentive. Uh, Director Carmi inquired whether some obsolete regulations and standards could be adjusted or eliminated. Mr. Dunacost suggest, suggested that this could be done by him and his staff during their weekly meetings and that he could compile a list for consideration for a third board to act on in the future. Uh, the revised alteration fee schedule was also discussed, resulting in several clarifying suggestions. Mr. Don Koss stated, stated that the 40% increase in most of the fees was driven by staff hours necessary to process specific permits. Advisor plan inquired if permit costs determined by a standard flat fee plus a percentage based on complexity or value might be more equitable. Mr. Donacost agreed to present such a proposal at the next ACSC meeting. Uh, Mr. Donacost also indicated that the per permitless app, uh, alteration program currently undergoing a six month trial in United has been pretty successful. And he also presented us with a copy of the United's resolution for us to consider. After a brief discussion, Director Muchnik uh, suggested a third wait until the trial period is over, which will be next month, uh, before we act to adopt a similar system in third. Uh, this item was consequently moved to further discussion items. Mr. Doncos gave a good review of the asbestos meeting once again, with, uh, which was way last April. Uh, there were some questions remaining to be cleared up, particularly with regarding definition of ownership resulting from previous alterations. This expected to take a little more definition of ownership and subsequent interpretation by AQMD regulations before third will be able to act by way of any local uh, resolution or regulations. The next meeting of the ACSC meeting is presently scheduled for June 28th at 9.30 a.m. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions? Okay, on to item 13C, Report of Communications Committee. Director McCary. Thank you, President Parsons. The third communications committee last met in January and our next meeting is scheduled for July 14th, 2021 at 1.30 p.m. Not quite sure if it's gonna be virtual or in person. Okay, thank you. On to 13D, Report of Maintenance and Construction Committee. Director Muchnick. Thank you, President Parsons. The MNC Committee last met on Monday, the 3rd of May. I updated everyone on the activities of the committee at our last board meeting uh, back in May. The next meeting of the MNC Committee will be on Wednesday, the 7th of July at 1.30. The meeting normally scheduled every other month on a Monday has been moved to July 7th, Wednesday, because of the holiday on Monday. So that's going to be Monday, uh, Wednesday, July 7th at 1.30, our next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Director Dotson isn't here. Uh, is anybody coming in her area? I do have one question. Okay, I think the most pressing question here is, have we heard, and this is to staff, have we heard anything back on the EV grant status? Anything come back? I don't know that we specifically have had any um, new information. I know that, they, that we're waiting for Edison to, to you know, put out the full um, packet, and that hasn't happened yet that I'm aware of. Okay. Yeah, I hadn't heard anything either. <clears throat> Just as an update. Thank you. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll get back to you, in this, especially this afternoon, too. Okay. Thank you very much. On to Garden Villa Rec Room Subcommittee. Director Jarrett, please. Thank you, President Parsons. Um, the Rec Room Subcommittee met on June the 8th. Uh, we really had a, a rather short meeting because we didn't really get uh, that much accomplished as far as a lot of different uh, components installed this year. 
because what we did, we took the money primarily, the bulk of the money uh, in our fund this year and had our, and replaced all the chairs. And that was quite a significant job. You had uh, 53 rec rooms and 50 of them had to get new chairs. So uh, the other uh, items that we purchased were four servitors in the kitchen and they would have all been installed by now, but there was a hang up in trying to get the refrigerator parts because we only buy GE for refrigerators, uh, but there's a part missing that they're, they're, not, they're not on the market yet. They're hard to get. And I'm sure you, you hear the news and you know that refrigerator, new refrigerators are almost hard to buy right now. So what we did is uh, we decided to go ahead and uh, take some refrigerators out of the warehouse uh, that are slightly used, that were brought over from United, and we'll probably pay about $100 per refrigerator, and put those in the kitchens that we're installing to give those people those new servitors because they're, they're really, really old and out of date and, and unusable, really. So that's one of the biggest things we did. Uh, we couldn't go over the budget because we're waiting for a report from finance that we had just requested a week prior to that. So um, anyway, and then two, because of the pandemic and um, the maintenance department really didn't have to do much for us this year for the rec rooms simply because it was replacing the chairs. That wasn't really a big deal. And the servitors aren't really uh, that big of an installation. So next year, the rec room uh, maintenance department, they're going to be busy because people will be back using the rec rooms and uh, they're going to be busy replacing more components next year. And um, <clears throat> it was requested uh, that the uh, all the rec rooms were going to be open by the 15th, so we needed to get them cleaned because they hadn't been used for a long time. So uh, general services is on top of that. and. Um, and that's about it. Uh, our next meeting will be scheduled probably the first week in October, but we don't have a, a, date, a date at this time. Thank you. Okay, any questions? Okay, on to report landscape committee, Director Jarrett. All right, we met on June the 11th, <clears throat> and uh, we found Oh, I'm sorry. How long has it been off? <laughs> the whole thing. Why don't you oh, get it, it back on the... Uh, I don't know how that happened. Okay. I'm going to start over. Um, anyway, we had our landscape meeting on the 11th of June, and we found that uh, all the slope work, the tree work, and the grounds maintenance work is being done and handled on time. <clears throat> we had several requests for tree removals and... Uh, tree trimming requests that we approved, but they're not on the consent calendar today because our meeting was held shortly before our agenda prep meeting and there wasn't uh, enough time to, to be allowed to get those items on the consent calendar. So they'll be on the consent calendar for the July meeting. So you'll see those along with all the work, other uh, items that we approve or deny, whatever the case may be. Uh, one revision we made, one request we made, was, we approved, was uh, a revision in landscaping for one manor, and uh, all the work was approved, and it wasn't anything that we are going to do, but we approved that the resident could do that work at their own expense. All work like that always has to be approved by the landscape department, and that, that took place. Uh, last week, we had a very interesting tour, and it was actually a tour of the whole landscape areas, like the nursery, the warehouse, the mulch yard. It was incredible. <clears throat> the committee, the landscape committee, we were really, really lucky, the right place at the right time to get this tour because our landscape director has never given such a tour. And, and we just were amazed. We, we had no idea that the mulch yard was unbelievably 
interesting because of all the science that's involved in making compost piles and taking the manure from the uh, equestrian center and uh, putting that in compost. And it, it was just absolutely unbelievable. And in the nursery itself, because they had a new building over there, they're getting, uh, they have gone to the point, actually, over the past two years, uh, Director Wyman has done a lot of great things here for our landscaping. And in that period of time, they've started to plant all the plants and seeds, or all, they have to plant all the plants through seeds or clippings. They don't buy any plants. The only plants they may buy is a few larger trees because those are hard to grow and get them growing in a very uh, short period of time. But we really, really had an education. And what was really nice, nice about it was when we got finished and we talked about it, we came back and we met our landscape meeting and the director told us that the company is going to make a video of this so the old residents can see this tour. So we are just happy that the residents are gonna see this because they will be amazed because what you see when you go in through our village, you see the grass cutting and you see the trees, you see the beautiful flowers, but you don't realize that those, there's a lot of work in the background. And so I'm really gonna be happy that the residents are gonna be able to see this in a video once it's, and it's gonna be produced by TV6, so it's gonna be professional. So it's really, really something. I'm, I'm just so happy about this. So uh, our next meeting is going to be July 1 at 9.30 a.m. Thank you. Okay, just a question for you. Some other people have asked me. Uh, how do they get some compost? Can it be delivered or uh, do they have to go get it somewhere? What's the process in doing that? Well, I, I don't know the process, but if you call resident services and request it, they'll find, they'll find out. But... We need to ask Kurt that. Do you know that, Siobhan? No, How but I will get, get it back delivered? to you. Okay. Uh, one of the things is that people complain about not getting mulch. It actually shouldn't be a complaint. If you need mulch, all you need to do is call resident services, and they will deliver some mulch for your place, I tell you. And, and Director Jarrett, I believe Kurt mentioned that at certain times of the month, it, several clubhouses, one in Third and one in United, where there is a place where people can go and actually get mulch. Oh, thank you, Annie. That is true. That is true. Ooh. That's another one. I didn't write that one down. Thank you. Yeah, if we can publicize that, that might help some people. Yeah, right. <clears throat> and uh, since we had trouble with uh, Director Jarrett's mic, just to recap a little bit about the uh, uh, rec rooms, Garden Villa rec rooms, they are now open. Uh, staff is in helping clean them. Uh, since they haven't been used or opened up for a while. So please bear with us on that and uh, contact your building captain with any questions you might have. Okay, uh, any other questions for Director Jarrett? Thank you. Thank you. I was really impressed by looking at the nursery and it was very educational and I'm glad that they're going to make the video. Also, I suggest that if they organize visit by the members Mm -hmm. that they take them with a the bus and show them. That's a showcase. I mean, it is, it's vast, you know, uh, activities out there, and it's very pretty and relaxing, and the members can go as organized effort, go there and look at it and tour the area and uh, learn about it. And if they want to add something in the future, they can request that for their manure, <laughs> for their, uh, you know, uh, residents. It's, it's very pretty. And I suggest our member go and look at it in an organized way. Now, don't drive by because they won't <laughs> let you in because it has well, to be I, organized. Where were you when Kurt says that can't happen? That's why they're going to do the video. We really want the members to see all this, but it's impossible to take them there on tours on a, on a, ba on a regular basis because it would be really great if they could do that, but he told me that wasn't possible. So it's just a wish. If but it it's impossible, it's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to be talking here in a minute about uh, the Water Committee, and uh, Director McCurry is going to be talking about this. But before you start in that, could you talk about the new Village Breeze a little bit? Yeah, I was going to do that on the media and communication. Oh, okay. She'll do that on media and communication. Well, let's go ahead with the Water Committee then. 
So we do have a, a, a quick slide presentation that was put together. Director Donna is not able to be here today, so I'm giving this report for her. So Grant, if you will start with the slides, I'm ready. Okay, Water Resource uh, Subcommittee Report, June 15th, 2021. Next slide, please. So these are basically um, some information for everybody about the importance of water conservation. So first of all, to consider the cost of water to Third Mutual, uh, $2.7 million annually on average through 2019, and uh, three million for 2020. The El Toro Water District is to increase water rates starting July 1st, 2021. As of now, we're not quite sure what those rates will be, but July 1st, the rates will be increased. Water in South Orange County, virtually all drinking water in South Orange County must be imported, and this is really important. It's an enormous cost to transport over long distance. California is expecting a severe drought conditions this summer and now, and we need to conserve wherever we can. Next slide, Grant, please. Some of the ways that water conservation is actually taking place right now, and these are things for us to remember, the landscape department, what they're actually doing is replacing turf with drought tolerant plants wherever appropriate. And if you walk through the village, you can see areas where there are drought tolerant plants. They are also having more efficient sprinkler system, which is another ongoing project for the landscape department. There are some things that residents can do to help with the water conservation. Uh, if, you need, if you have a medical need for bathing uh, that causes an increase in the water consumption, there are some potential rate reductions that you can apply for through the El Toro Water District. You can also report leaks in your unit and your building. Car washing is not permitted at all in Third Mutual. Next slide, uh, Grant, please. Some additional water saving tips. You can install aerators at shower heads and faucets. This can actually save 1.2 gallons per day. Washing a full load of clothes and dishes. Uh, clothes washers, you can save 15 to 40, well, actually takes 15 to 45 gallons per load. The dishwasher takes 5 to 15 gallons per load. Some additional things you can do is turn off your water when you're brushing your teeth. This actually saves, uh, wow, 10 gallons um, per day. Next slide, Grant, please. Some additional water saving tips. Shorter showers, five minutes saves 12.5 gallons of, um, per shower with an efficiency head. 12.5 gallons of shower per day, if you do one shower per day times um, 6,102 condos, that equals 76,275 gallons of water per day. You can also install high efficiency toilets. El Toro Water District actually gives up to a $100 rebate. So you can apply for that through, again, the El Toro Water District. Um, also, these high efficiency toilets can save 19 gallons of water per day. Fixing leaks averages 110 gallons per month. And another important note, if you get an excessive water usage letter, which many residents have gotten, one of the things that you can do is obtain a blue tablet from the community center to help actually detect the leaks in your, uh, especially your toilet. Again, you can call resident services and arrange to pick up those tablets. I believe that is the last slide. Is there another slide, Grant? That is the end of the report. The next water committee um, is scheduled to meet July 29th, 2020 at 2021 at 12, 2 p.m. And I'm not quite sure, well, that's not a, one of our meetings. So the location and all that will be announced. Okay, thank you very much. Any comments from anyone? Okay, thank you very much. On to uh, report of the Resident Policy and Compliance Committee, Director Jarrett. There was no meeting this month, uh, President Parsons, and uh, we we have we haven't scheduled the next meeting yet. We'll be announcing it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, any committees we've overlooked or subcommittees? Okay, we'll move along to GRF committee highlights. Uh, 14A uh, CAC Director Karimi. 
Thank you, President Parson. Uh, the good thing about the report for the CAC is that uh, Mr. Pa uh, Parker covers all of it, pretty much. <laughs> and uh, the CAC meeting, we uh, discussed the uh, reopening of all the facilities and the manpower that we discussed. I'm not going to go over it again. <coughs> there was discussion of facility fees. Uh, there was discussion on the locker fees. And there were uh, discussion about the use of Clubhouse 2 uh, for, uh, ter by third party for the July 3rd and 4th, that how much they had charged and all of that. Because if there's are not Laguna Wood Village uh, activities or events, and it's third party, they usually have to cover everything, including the security. So the fees are in discussion. Those are all were discussed. Uh, the next meeting is for July 8th at 1.30. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> Director Botta will now talk to us about the Equestrian Center Ad Hoc Committee. Uh, thank you, President Parsons. Uh, I'd love to say something more, but we didn't have a meeting this month, so I don't have anything new to report. Our next meeting is July 7th, 2021 at 1 p.m. Okay. Now the GRF Finance Committee, Director Muchnick. Okay, similar to Director Bada, uh, I don't have much to report. The committee, uh, GRF Finance Committee last met on the 21st of April. I gave you a detailed report at our May meeting. The next meeting of the GRF Finance Committee is scheduled for Thursday, the 24th of June at 1.30 p.m. Thank you very much. Uh, GRF Landscape Committee, Director Jarrett. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> the committee met on June the 9th, and um, it was very interesting. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Director Wim Wyman reported that annuals are being uh, placed at the gates, replaced at the gates three times a year so that we can make it colorful coming into the community. And as I recall, Director Karimi requested that we get some annuals, you know, the gates. So if you check the gates out, they really, really, really look nice. They're going to do that three times a year. Last week, um, Director Kimi, <laughs> Director Wyman, was going to uh, meet with the, the wildlife agency. I'm not sure which one. There's so many involved with the creek. And uh, he was gonna, they were gonna look around. They've got several issues with the creek, but they really keep the creek up nicely. But there's so many rules they have to follow with all these agencies involved. So he was gonna be spending a day with one of those agencies last week. Um, <clears throat> they have a problem down there, and I, I walk down there maybe once a week, and there's a bullfrog back again. And the problem with the bullfrogs, and the residents have been complaining about it, because basically they know now, the residents, that the bullfrogs go after the pond turtles that people put in there. So, you know, people just throw turtles in there. Those are pond turtles. And it, it's not good. They, we don't want any. There's only one protected frog in that creek, and that's the only one that's supposed to be there. So we don't want it to get damaged or killed or whatever. Uh, the other thing is that they've decided they're going to cut the cattails twice a year, although some people would like to have it more often. But I don't think that's going to happen. But that's another agency that handles that's a rule of the agency. Uh, the next thing, anyway, it's interesting because a lot of things go on with the creek that we, we don't realize. Here, especially in third, and unless you go there and walk or go to a little concert there or something, you really don't know what's going on to the creek. But it's very well taken care of, very well taken care of. The next meeting will be August the 11th. Thank you, President Parsons. Thank you very much. Uh, on to GRF Maintenance and Construction Committee. Do we have a report from anyone on that? Director Dotson uh, had to be out of town, I think. She did. Oh, okay. Okay, we'll move on to Clubhouse One Renovation Ad Hoc Committee. Director Engdahl, please. I don't believe there's been anything since uh, uh, last March on that, nothing that I've heard of or picked up on. So we have had no meeting. 
uh, next meeting is uh, still to be determined. Okay, uh, I'd like to turn to our CEO. Do you have any update on anything there? Yes, the, um, the committee, um, the board and is looking at combining <coughs> Clubhouse One and, and looking at um, forming, a, the, using the same group of talking about clubhouses uh, and doing a more global evaluation of all the clubhouses as opposed mm -hmm. to just Clubhouse One. So yeah. I think that the um, strategic um, committee that they have along <coughs> with the, as a sub category that they already have is looking at expanding responsibilities and review to encompass all of the clubhouses as, as opposed to just Clubhouse One. Okay, thank you very much. I'd heard a little bit of that, but I didn't hear enough to know. So thank you very much. Okay, on to uh, 14E. Uh, Director McCary will talk about Media and Communications Committee. Thank you, President Parsons. The committee met last on May 17th and I gave a report at our last board meeting. The next meeting is June 21st um, at 1.30 p.m. Uh, but I wanted to highlight that uh, the June-July issue of The Breeze is out now and it's got some really, really interesting good articles. It's got a beautiful cover on it. But in addition to that, there is a section devoted to each mutual, and in the third mutual section, there's a nice article about the special election for our insurance, and it's got additional information, so if residents missed any of the information that uh, has come up in the town hall meetings or anything that we've said, um, this article in The Breeze is a really good reminder of what's coming up. It's got the purpose of the amendment, some important things you need to know. There is also a number that you can call, as President Parsons alluded to earlier, if you have not received your ballot. It's also got deadlines in it, so it's really good information to have. In addition, there's also another article on water conservation, and it's got really good information, again, on what we can do to conserve water so another good uh, source of information to have. So um, in addition to that, one thing I didn't mention in, in terms of water, for uh, Third Mutual, the total water bill for 2021 was $3,067. And it's projected for 2021-22 to be $3,222. So there's still ongoing reminders that we really do need to focus on water conservation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, on to Mobility and Vehicles Committee, Director Karimi. Uh, President Parson, uh, the Mobility and Vehicle Committee met on June 2nd. Uh, the next meeting is uh, scheduled for August 4th. Uh, the report uh, indicates that the fixed route ridership is increasing now that the uh, village is open. In April, we had 6,290 6, rides per month, and that's about 386 users. Uh, and uh, well, the fixed route mainly uh, used for the wellness route and uh, Clubhouse 1, Clubhouse 2. Those are the most used route. The journey ride ship also is uh, uh, increasing. We have the 509 rides. Uh, with the 75 users. This is curbside to curbside services. We have about 16 bus at any given time, about nine or 10 of them in the service. The other one all, you know, out of repair or uh, they're not in use. The boost lift, they had 36 riders. On Saturday, there is no bus service, but we have now the lift services from 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. on Saturday and eight to five on Sundays. Uh, and that uh, really uh, have a lot of saving, about $50,000 saving by using a lift for that Saturday, Sunday ridership. The total inventory of the vehicle is still at 375. Uh, the, about 142 of those vehicles, which is about 34% of it, exceed the expected life cycle and need to be uh, replaced over a period of time. That's the one of the biggest big ticket item that uh, is under discussion that how it's going to be done, how many vehicles per year, and how we're going to be replacing all of that. Out of those 37 of them, especially specialty equipment that we need to maintain and have uh, available for all the works. 
Uh, that's pretty much my report for the mobility and vehicle. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, on to Security and Community Access Committee, Director Bada. Uh, thank you, President Parsons. Uh, similarly, this committee did not meet in June. Uh, our last meeting was April 26th. So I have already provided the report at, in our previous board meetings. Our next meeting is June 28th, 2021 at 1.30 p.m. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Director McCary will be talking about Disaster Preparedness Task Force. Thank you, President Parsons. The Disaster Task Force met on May 25th. Um, the first uh, report came from the radio communications where Bruce Bonbright reported on the radio drills for April 27th and May 25th. Mr. Bonbright stated that on April 27th, um, nine out of 14 of the radios responded to the drill. I'm sorry, uh, yeah, uh, nine out of 14 radios responded to the drill. And then on May, 10 out of 14 radios responded. Mr. Bombright stated that he will work with the members uh, responsible for the new, for their radios to see what exactly transpired to make sure, sure that these radios are functioning properly. Uh, in terms of uh, the office manager's report, that, uh, uh, Carlos Rojas reported that he's looking at the inventory to make sure that we have ample supply of inventory on hand when the office is actually open again. So we look forward to more information on that. Retu recruitment and retention training is an ongoing process. Um, uh, Jayana Headley reported that she's working with several members of the, the Disaster Preparedness Task Force to create a training curriculum that will be used to train future good neighbor captains. And more information will be coming with that. In addition, she also reported that they're working with the Orange County Fire Authority and they've learned they are actually encouraging people to use what's called a file for life and which an emergency medical file should be used and should be kept. And the refrigerator seems to be the more common place for this file. So in the event that rescue uh, teams come in, they know exactly where the consistent location for the emergency file. So more information will be coming with that as well. Um, the next committee meeting is scheduled for July 29th at 2 p.m. Okay, thank you very much. On to report of Laguna Woods Village traffic hearings. Uh, does anybody have that? Our directors that are generally on it are gone. I believe that committee meeting is scheduled for tomorrow. Okay. I would like to remind people to stop at stop signs. It seems to be habitual <laughs> that uh, not only golf carts, but cars, uh, even coming off of Santa Maria or places like that, they are not stopping at stop signs. And uh, one lesson learned that I had was a nighttime on Carrizo uh, that uh, I looked both ways at a stop sign, started to go, and all of a sudden somebody was right in front of me. They had no light clothes on, they had dark hair, everything. This situation happened to me twice. So be very careful, even when it's daylight, that uh, stop at stop signs, look both ways before you go. Uh, it might save you from an accident. Another thing is speeding. Uh, still notice people uh, trying to speed a little bit, uh, probably trying to take advantage of uh, 25 mile an hour speed limit, go a little faster. But uh, the speed limit is set for reasons. So when you go out, watch for pedestrians, watch out for cars pulling out in front of you. Uh, it's not a time in here to get surprised when you're driving around. So please take that to heart if you would. Any other comments about that, uh, Director Bada? I want to mention that the speed limit is 25 on the streets, but if you're in a cul-de-sac mm -hmm. or a smaller connecting street, the speed limit goes down to 15. Mm -hmm. And many a times when people, especially in my street where I live, when you're pulling out of your parking spot, it's difficult to see because of the side wall of the parking structure. And we're mm -hmm. coming out slowly, and there's somebody zooming past behind you, and that is being inconsiderate. People, when they see people pulling out, to please stop and let the people come out. They cannot see you. We are, we've averted so many different uh, 
possible crashes. So mm -hmm. just want people to know that 15 miles and be considerate, that's all. Yes, another caution too that I've noticed uh, and actually talked to a few of the drivers are their delivery trucks. People de delivering packages to you. Uh, remember, these folks move very quickly. And if you are watching, you're gonna get hit by them or possibly hit them. Uh, they jump out of their trucks, deliver the bag, get back in, and take off. So be very careful when you spot a delivery truck. Okay, that's all I had on that. Any other comments or questions? I have a, I have a comment. Sure, go ahead. Two, just two things. One, be sure you wear white at night so that you can be seen. And secondly, don't just assume that because you step off the curb, everybody else is going to stop. Those cars are a lot bigger than you are, so look carefully. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, on to uh, GRF Strategic Planning Ag Hawk Committee, Director Muchnick. Okay, thank you, uh, President Parsons. This committee uh, last met March 17th. They're in the process of reorganizing, and uh, there will be a date announced very shortly of when this committee will meet again, but it's uh, going to be scheduled soon. Okay, and on to budget meeting, if you'd continue on, please. Yes, please. Since our last board meeting, numerous budget workshops have been held. These budget workshops are designed to provide the third board members with information about ongoing and proposed projects. The first draft of a budget, as proposed by the directors of each of the VMS divisions, was also shared. Given the expected impact of our insurance, and I know I keep repeating this, but it's that impactful in terms of our budget for next year. Given the expected impact of our insurance costs for next year, plus certain expenses increasing because of contracts and state law, we asked each VMS director to present their budgets with an eye to where we might be able to save some money to offset the cost of insurance. We asked each director to propose possible reductions that did not impact the infrastructure of Third Mutual, nor did we want to lay off or terminate any employees. Each director presented places that we might be able to save money should it become necessary. I remind you that if the insurance amendment does not pass and the board is required to purchase 100% replacement cost property insurance, should it be available, the largest assessment by law that we can pass on to members is $93 per manor per month. But I also want to share with you, that's the largest assessment that Third Mutual can impose. There is also the potential for an increased assessment by GRF. They could increase their assessment by as much as $40 per manor per month under state law. Now, I don't believe they're going to do that, but I do expect them to increase their assessment going forward next year. So it could be the 93, if the amendment doesn't pass, it could be the $93 per manor per month from, uh, from third, plus whatever GRF increases its assessment. So this is why we're asking each VMS director, when they presented their programs and projects and budgets, to include places where we might be able to save money should the need arise. Ernesto Munez, Director of Maintenance and Construction, presented his programs and supporting budget with a goal of identifying up to $5 million in savings for next year. He did an excellent job of identifying just over $4 million in potential savings. Please understand, we really do not want to reduce or curtail any of the programs or projects we currently have in place. Should it become necessary, we want to be prepared. That's why we asked for that list. Kurt Wyman, Director of Landscaping, was asked to find approximately a half a million dollars in budget reduction. Again, without reducing staff or the quality of landscaping we currently have. Director Lynn Jarrett, Chair of Third's Landscaping Committee, worked closely with De Director Wyman to identify possible places we could shave some costs. Together, they came up with approximately $300,000 should we need it. Chris Lagenau, Director of General Services, identified approximately $73,000 from his proposed budget that we could reclaim should the need arise. All of the above potential reductions come from two areas, operating and reserves. Some of the reserve funds, while we may be able to save money, they don't really represent a dollar-for-dollar dollar savings since it's from a reserve fund. 
what we may be able to do with the project's programs, where the savings would be from reserve funds, is to reduce how much the monthly assessment is directed to the operational reserve funds and redirect that part of the assessment. Understand, that doesn't mean your assessment's going to go down because we are saving money from the reserve. We're going to redirect that money to help offset some of the cost of insurance. The money that we could save from the operating budget could be used dollar for dollar to directly offset some of our costs. Please know that your board is working very hard to take all the pieces of the puzzle that make up the budget, insurance to be a very large percentage of the budget, and we're trying to fit all those pieces of the puzzle together with the least impact on your pocketbook as well as our own personal pocketbook in terms of the increase in the monthly assessment. At the same time, understand we're trying to balance that with the necessity of maintaining the infrastructure with our ongoing programs. The board will continue to meet as we work through the next drafts of the budget, mindful of the impact any changes may have on the bottom line. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very important information. Okay, any question for Director Muchnick? Okay, on to item 15, future agenda items. Uh, anything that you'd like to add on this? Okay, hearing none, we'll go to director's comments and uh, start with Director Bada. Thank you, Director Parsons. Um, I'd like to mention um, a couple things. One is that we are opening up and uh, being able to go around and we have all our facilities opening uh, progressively. But I want everybody to be mindful, to be able to uh, understand that we are coming out of a one and a half years of, I don't want to use the word trauma, but it was almost like that, staying home and being cooped up. So be mindful what you do, how you do, and stay safe and be controlled about your health. The second thing, I don't want to sound repetitious, I think Director Muchnik has very eloquently told us that insurance is one of the most crucial things for us this year. So what we need to do is vote. Please vote yes and get it out there. I've been walking the streets, knocking on doors, telling people to do that also. And I think people have not been, uh, don't want to use the word lackadaisy about their ballots, but they haven't paid attention to the mails that they have received and mailed the ballots back. So please, urging you all that mail your ballots. That's all I can tell you. Otherwise, we'll have to dig deep into our pockets and shell out big bucks. So do that. Thank you. Okay, Director Karimi. Thank you, President Parson. Uh, my comments is directed toward our members of the Third Laguna Wood Village. Uh, the inflation is upon us. The cost of water is going up. The cost of labor is going up. The cost of insurance is going up. We need your support and your help to provide superior services at a reasonable cost. To do that, we need your vote. This is not Uncle Sam. This is Uncle Reza asking for your vote. Please vote yes so we can help ourselves. Vote with your pocket. Thank you. Director Mochini. I'm not sure what to say after, after, Uncle, after Uncle Reza. Uncle Reza. <laughs> I do want to reiterate uh, something that uh, Director Parsons said at the very beginning. I want the folks who are out there who have been working, members of the uh, third uh, community who have been working very hard to try to help us get this vote approved. It's really been wonderful to see the positive working relationship between the board and members of the community in a joint effort to get this accomplished. So I want to just say a big thank you to all of those folks who've been out there distributing the flyers, sending out email blasts, putting up the signs that are now outside all of the gates for Third Mutual that say vote yes. 
Uh, they folks also have uh, put money out of their own pocket to uh, make the signs and put up the signs. They've also uh, put the uh, signs on the back of cars and parked them at the front of the gates in legal spots. I want them to know how much we appreciate as a board all of the efforts that they have put forth in working cooperatively with us on this. So I just want to say thank you to all of them. Okay, I'll switch over here. Uh, Craig, welcome. The first thing we have to do is learn how to use this machine again, right? <laughs> push the button, push the button. <laughs> yeah, on a lighter note, frog legs are really delicious. <laughs> so if someone over there in that area wants to catch the frog, I think that if you contact Lynn Jarrett, she probably can come up with a recipe for you. <laughs> Thank you. A little humor. Okay, <laughs> okay Director Engdahl. <laughs> I have no further comical comments or serious ones. Thank you. Okay, Director Jarrett. <laughs> well, I have a few things to say. <clears throat> Well, I want to reiterate what my um, fellow directors have been saying about the thanks for the members of the community out there working, putting out flyers, because I know that last week, uh, Director Munchnick had 4,000 flyers printed up and taken to those folks out there, and they've been putting flyers out. They've been doing a heck of a job. And there's a couple people that are really, I don't know who they're, what their names are, but someone in the Chinese club, I think the president, Irene, has uh, put out uh, something for all of the members of the Chinese club uh, to, she put it out in Chinese, which is wonderful, to vote yes. So we really, really appreciate that. And also someone that did that for the Korean club. So these people are real important. Mm -hmm. Now, if we wanted to do the ballots to get everybody, all languages in this village, we'd have to do 18 uh, languages. We have to do ballots in 18 languages. So it's not possible. So anyway, I really appreciate uh, the Chinese and Korean club's participation in uh, having their members to understand exactly how important it is to vote. Another thing uh, the board of directors here are doing, several of us are making calls to the non-resident members. And that's real important. And this morning before the board meeting, I was commiserating with director uh, Ingdahl, uh, we were talking about when we make these calls, uh, how interesting it is to hear these people, and they, they're interested in talking to us, almost all of them, if they answer their phones, of course. But uh, it, it's interesting, and a lot of them, you know, even live back east, up north, they live all over the United States. We have uh, ones overseas, but we didn't call those. But anyway, it's interesting to talk to these people, because when we say we're a member of the third board, they're mutual here in Laguna Woods. Their ears pop open, they start asking questions, and we converse with them. So I think it's really, we're doing everything we can uh, to get this yes vote and how important it is. Another thing I wanted to uh, uh, go a little bit deeper into the water issue. Uh, when I read the newspaper this weekend and your Belinda was uh, talking about their 16.5% water increase for residents, and then we got information from El Toro Water Board this week, Water District, that uh, our bill went up 16.5% this past year. Now, it's projected for this coming year, actually beginning July the 1st, it's projected our budget for, for water and sewer will amount to $233,000 increase. That is huge on our budget. And that's not just for one year. Every year it's gonna get more expensive and more expensive because we're in the middle of a mega drought. So Donna Range, uh, I don't know how you say her name. Donna. Uh, Sister. She, uh, yeah, she, our director Donna, she is working on modern conversation, conservation, and she's getting very serious in this. And it is a very serious matter. So I'm really glad that Donna is putting her heart and soul in that. And there's only one more thing that I want to mention. I didn't say it in member, uh, member comments when Direct, or, um, Mr. Hutchins of 30, 36 Vista talked about the plumbing uh, and how they changed out the water valve. Also, uh, the letter that the staff, that they received from the staff, I I'm hoping that the staff will, uh, you know, 
uh, re-edit that letter that goes out to those folks because I think it's really important what they get. But I want to remind the people, and I know this is not an MNC meeting, but in those three-story buildings where you have uh, 22 units and you have four quadrants for the water, the water shutoffs. And if those water shutoff valves are old, and believe me, several of them are old, mm -hmm. uh, if, if a plumber, your outside plumber comes in and does work for you, and that plumber goes down and turns off one of those valves and it breaks, that's a $300 fine. So I just want to remind people, you have to get the, our plumbers to come out and turn the water off. So you have to plan on that. If it's possible to plan before you have a break. And at some point, I'd, I'd like to see all those water shutoff valves checked out because they're really, some of them are really getting old. And that's all I have to say. Good meeting, folks, and thank you. And vote yes. Thank you. Uh, Donna has joined us via Zoom. Are there comments that you'd like to make in closing here? Just to reiterate what everyone has said about the yes vote and voting and the importance of it. Um, anyone who doesn't vote has essentially voted no because of the requirement of 67% of owners saying yes. Um, I want to thank Director McCary for presenting the Water Conservation Committee report. Um, I think you, from her comments as well as uh, Director Jarrett's comments, you can see how important it is. And we're all in it together and we'll work hard. And with that, um, it's wonderful to know we're reopening. It's great to see all of you in the boardroom, and I expect to be there at the next meeting in person. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much. Director McCary. Thank you, President Parsons. I have a couple of comments, and one of them has to do with something our CEO mentioned in um, one of his responses, and it had to do with a cooling center in, in operation. And summer is amongst us now, and the temperatures are really, really starting to heat up. And while there are cooling centers in some of the outdoor activities, when we go for our morning walks or our midday walks or afternoon walks, we don't have that same uh, uh, system available. So it's really, really important that when we're out walking, myself included, that we keep ourselves hydrated. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't want you to conserve water at the risk of not drinking water to keep yourself hydrated. But it's really, really important that you keep yourself hydrated, sunscreen if, if you need it, wear your, I see people walking with their sun hats and, and that and that's really good and so we're asking a lot of you we're asking you to vote yes we're asking you to conserve water we're asking you to to come alive and and we want you to stay healthy and we want you to stay happy so please keep yourself hydrated as you fill out your ballot and vote yes thank you <laughs> <laughs> okay to our ceo jeff nothing other than welcome back <laughs> thank you siobhan I have a quick update on mulch distribution. This will occur at the end of June at clubhouses three and five. More details to come, so watch for it in the Friday blast. Okay, can we also put a crawler on that? Yes, I can check into that. If you would, okay. Uh, Grant, anything? No comment, thank you. Okay, um, I have just a couple comments. First off, uh, have fun and play safely. Uh, don't forget uh, what Annie just said about hydration. And I want to give a personal apology to our VMS board representatives. Uh, they were supposed to be able to join our meeting today. Uh, sorry, I forgot about that. It was after our uh, agenda prep meeting. So in the future, they will be part of our board meetings and give an update uh, as they would like to do. So uh, once again, thanks everybody for joining and enjoy your day and enjoy things opening up. We'll go ahead and adjourn at this time under recess.